So are we online now, Howie? Are we ready to go? Yep, if it says live, yes. Okay, great. I'm Chris Hedges. Uh, I'm interviewing uh, Green Party presidential candidate Howie Hawkins. Uh, I've interviewed him before. Uh, if you go on YouTube, you can look at my interview. I did it for my show on Contact. Uh, and I suggested to Howie that today we really focus on all the arguments that are have been and will um, be thrown at third-party candidates uh, as spoilers, as um, responsible for electing George W. Bush, going all the way back to Ralph Nader in 2000. Uh, these are not arguments that I buy or that Howie buys. Um, but certainly if you're watching MSNBC or CNN or Fox, uh, you're never going to hear the counter argument. And uh, nobody makes that counter argument better than Howie. Uh, and that's really the purpose of this video is to focus on uh, those canards that are thrown out against third party candidates, the whole uh, mantra of the least worst. Uh, and I would just to begin, say, if you followed the Bernie Sanders campaign, there were a series of articles in the New York Times quoting uh, the Democratic Party donor class, including Lloyd Blankfein and others, uh, who made it very clear that if Bernie was the nominee, they would vote for Trump. Uh, so the whole mantra of the least worst uh, only matters for us. It doesn't matter for them. Uh, let's just begin, Howie, uh, with the fact that uh, without question, Trump is the worst president in American history. He actually makes George W. Bush look uh, presidential. Um, he has he is carrying out an assault uh, on the rule of law. Uh, he is attempting to destroy, uh, or I think democratic institutions have been degraded, but certainly attempting to really crush uh, any kind of check on his power. And then uh, of deep concern to me is the fact that he uh, is filling his ideological void with Christian fascists. That's Mike Pence. Uh, Chomsky argues that if Trump uh, was impeached, Pence would be worse with probably some validity. Uh, Betsy DeVos, uh, Mike Pompeo, uh, Ben Carson, um, Barr, and others. Uh, so I think we have to acknowledge the severity of the Trump administration. So let's just open by speaking about those issues before we begin to talk about our response. Well, the implication there is that the Democrats, we can rely on the Democrats to fight the far right. And just look at the record, all the wars that the Democrats support with the Republicans, including right now, attempts to overthrow the regime in Venezuela. Um, you've got charter schools. Betsy DeVos pushes privatization, but that was a big policy of the Obama administration. We have corporate criminals like Wilbur Ross and Steve Mnuchin who were among the central characters in the theft of 14 million homes by the banking industry that cut black America's wealth in half because of predatory lending and foreclosures. And then the robo signing that both of them were involved in, especially Wilbur Ross, he had these mortgage servicing companies, that was computerized fraud that stole people's homes. And the Obama administration did not prosecute. The way the Wall Street Journal summarized Eric Holder's testimony at the beginning of the second term when senators were asking, you know, what about the, nobody's, you know, been charged? And he said, basically, the way the Wall Street Journal characterized it, they're too big to jail. And then you got the war criminals like Elliot Abrams back in, back in power with the Trump administration. The Obama administration refused to, quote unquote, look back at the torturers. The only person involved in torture was somebody who blew the whistle, John Kiriakou, on the CIA waterboarding. So the implication that the best way to fight the right is to rely on the Democrats, we have the record. It's not an effective strategy. I mean, there is a difference between Biden and Trump, I think we have to acknowledge. Uh, and it's why the oligarchic elite, uh, the corporate elite, prefers Biden in the same way they preferred Clinton. Uh, because it's uh, a more acceptable face of empire. Trump is clearly an embarrassment. Uh, but it just before we begin, uh, because there, are, uh, uh, you know, Biden was the architect of everything from the Iraq War to mass incarceration, repeated calls uh, throughout his 
tenure in the Senate for uh, slashing Social Security. Um, he was back uh, when he began as a senator, one of the uh, strong uh, opponents of desegregation and busing. Uh, but let's talk about the differences between Biden and Trump, because there are differences. Well, how, what, how would you characterize those differences? Well, I think the tone at the top would be different. Trump is openly racist. He, you know, ridicules marginalized groups. And that encourages the white racist terrorist groups to go out and kill people of color, Muslims, Jews. I mean, we've had a lot of that. That's the real terrorism problem right now. So I think Biden would set a different tone, which would be a positive step. But when it gets to policy, I mean, let's take a life or death issue, the nuclear arms race that's escalating. The Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists has moved their doomsday clock the closest it's ever been to midnight. We got hypersonic nuclear weapons that now are six times faster than the previous strategic nukes. So you don't launch on warning, you launch on anticipation. And we're putting more nukes into conventional forces with a crazy military doctrine that we can use tactical nukes to quote unquote escalate to de-escalate. But as Daniel Ellsberg showed us in his book, The Doomsday Machine, which he was a nuclear war planner before he was a Vietnam war planner. He knows that subject. Once the nukes start flying, it's like automated. They all go and we're over. So I don't see on life or death issues like that, from climate change to inequality, working class life expectancies are declining in this country now. That's a life or death issue for a lot of people. On those issues, Biden is not going to be that different than Trump. And and I also think of Pelosi, you know, obstructing impeachment. I mean, Trump has a rap sheet a mile long, you know, from campaign finance violations, you know, to pay off, you know, those women to uh, open racism. I mean, that was the first impeachment resolution from Representative Al Green, encouraging people on the, you know, Border Patrol and ICE to break the law, Long Island police to break the law. I mean, there's so much they could have impeached him on. And they finally got around to it with that obvious case in Ukraine. But even then, instead of obstruction of justice and abuse of power, their presentation was all about Cold War messaging and a proxy war in Ukraine, which was not what people were concerned about. So, um, I, you know, there are differences, but when it gets down to the really important issues that affect us, you know, Biden is no better solution than Trump. Um, I, I just want to talk because you raised it. I think it's important about that uh, impeachment issue. Uh, Bruce Fine and Ralph Nader, Bruce Fine, a former senior official in the Department of Justice and a constitutional lawyer, uh, they identified 12 impeachable offenses. Of, uh, and the two that were chosen, as you correctly point out, uh, were, were, they would argue, the most uh, trivial. Uh, and that is because the Democratic Party uh, has engaged in these offenses, uh, these constitutional violations, uh, and they uh, they don't they don't want to see a restoration so much of the rule of law as uh, a use of uh, a, a few kind of legal violations in order to get Trump, uh, because that would roll back uh, their own uh, power. And and uh, I'm not going to go through all of them, but these are the declare war. Uh, clause, the uh, take care clause, the, uh, you know, the uh, appointments clause, which Obama violated, uh, et cetera, et cetera, violating citizen privacy with government spying, uh, suppression of free speech. This was all, uh, in essence, a bipartisan effort. Um, and uh, the other issue I want to raise, which perhaps you can speak about, is that, yes, while the rhetoric of a Clinton or a Biden is uh, less offensive. Uh, at the same time, these people have uh, the Clintons and, and Biden was at the center of this, ramped up the uh, machinery of institutional racism. It was Biden who was at the forefront of uh, doubling our prison population, tripling or quadrupling uh, sentences, uh, including ex vastly expanding crimes that uh, merit the death penalty. He used to brag about it. Uh, it it uh, militarizing 
police, uh, all of this, and slashing welfare. People forget that under Clinton, when we destroyed our welfare system, uh, and uh, mo you know mostly poor people of color, but 70% of those recipients were children. Uh, this was all Biden. So while the rhetoric, uh, Malcolm X writes about this, but while the rhetoric is, of course, much better, um, the actual policies are extremely punishing uh, to African Americans and and other people, uh, other people of color, especially poor people of color. Absolutely, I mean the whole Democratic Party, including the liberals. I talked to them in the state legislature in New York, uh, candidates for Congress, and they were all down with what they were doing in the '90s, Biden, the Clintons, about uh, those laws that increased penalties for uh, drugs and. Uh, there were repressive elements of the uh, anti-terrorism bill and then the attacks on welfare. I mean, that was bipartisan. The Democrats accommodated the right in that case. That's what Clinton's called triangulation. So the idea that, you know, we have to support Biden to stop the right, the, the right in Biden's record, they always accommodated the right. I mean, if the left disappears into the Democratic Party, it disappears. Yeah. It's not an alternative. And people think that's the lesser evil. And so they vote defensively for it against the Republicans if they're progressive or they're black, you know, because the Republicans to black folks looks like the Ku Klux Klan. But that doesn't really change the situation. Uh, yeah, Glenn uh, Ford calls the Republican Party uh, Trump's white man's party. Um, yeah. Well, they kind of are the Klan. I mean, Trump's father was a member of the Klan. Um, before I get into the issue of the tactic of least worst voting, which uh, the historical record, I think, quite uh, adequately exposes as utterly ineffective, I just want to tick off, if you vote for Biden, wh who, you know, what policies are you voting for? Well, to start with, you're voting against the Me Too movement, uh, and you're voting for the humiliation of courageous women, such as Anita Hill. Uh, you're voting for the architects of endless war in the Middle East. You're voting for the apartheid state in Israel. You're voting for the wholesale surveillance of the public by government intelligence agencies. Uh, you're voting for the abolition of uh, habeas corpus and due process. Uh, you're voting for punishing austerity programs, including, as we mentioned, the destruction of welfare and cuts to social security, which Biden has repeatedly called for. You're voting for NAFTA uh, and these free trade deals uh, and deindustrialization that has uh, brought about a collapse uh, of uh, the uh, working class, the decline in wages in real terms, the loss of hundreds of thousands of manufacturing jobs, uh, the offshoring of jobs to underpaid workers. I mean, GM opens plants in Monterey, Mexico, uh, closes plants in uh, Anderson, Indiana, all those unionized jobs are gone and, and Mexican workers are paid $3 an hour without benefits. And then all these trucks and cars are rolled back over the border and sold to us. Uh, you're uh, voting for, as you mentioned, an assault on public education. Uh, Arne Duncan was a huge proponent of charter schools in the Obama administration. Uh, you're voting for the doubling of our prison population. And as I mentioned, the tripling and quadrupling of sentences. Uh, and the expansion of crimes meriting the death penalty. You're voting for militarized police who gun down nearly 2,000 people a year, mostly poor people of color, almost all unarmed with impunity. Uh, you're voting against the Green New Deal and immigration reform. Uh, you're voting uh, for limiting a woman's right to abortion. This has also been something Biden has pushed. Uh, you're voting for a segregated public school system in which the wealthy receive educational opportunities and poor people of color do not. Uh, you're voting for punitive levels of student debt. Uh, you're voting and the inability to free yourself from that debt, courtesy of the Congress. You're voting for deregulating the banking industry, uh, including the abolition of Glass-Steagall. You're voting for the for-profit insurance and pharmaceutical corporations and against uh, health care for all. You're voting for these bloated defense budgets. Uh, you're voting for the use of unlimited oligarchic and corporate money to buy our elections. Uh, and you're voting for a politician, Joe Biden, who, when he was a senator out of Delaware, abjectly served the interests of uh, credit card companies like MBNA, which employed his son, Hunter. Uh, MBNA is the largest independent credit card company in the world and uh, was Biden's uh, major backer. So I just want to lay out, uh, you know, when you start voting for Biden, 
because you are voting for something, that's what you're getting. Yeah, that's for sure. I mean, so when people say we got to vote for Biden to stop Trump, well, what are you getting? getting everything that we've been fighting for. I mean, I often get told that you got to stand down in the battleground states and only run in the safe states. But for the Greens and for working class people, people of color, young people, every state is a battleground. I mean, let's just take climate. You know, the Democrats, even those elected Democrats that supported Bernie Sanders in the primary in Pennsylvania would not speak out against fracking. They're fracking the hell out of Pennsylvania. And Ohio, those are two battleground states and they're building pipelines to uh, build a plastics, a petrochemical plastics factory in uh, or complex down in Appalachia, which is a whole nother environmental problem. Or you go up to the uh, battleground states of Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Michigan, and Enbridge Line 5 is uh, what carries the Bakken oil that's fracked in North Dakota and also Alberta tar sands oil to be refined. And they want to expand that pipeline. And it's only the Greens that are fighting to uh, not just stop the expansion, but to shut it down because we got to shut down these, this fossil fuel infrastructure if we're going to deal with the climate problem. And it looks like we lost Chris. Well, we're still live. I saw Chris spill his coffee. I think that created a problem. So I guess I'll just start talking about, you know, the topic that uh, Chris raised is to, you know, why shouldn't I run safe states or even not run at all and endorse Biden? And the first thing I would say is you're wasting your vote. Chris just laid out all the things in Biden's record. And so there you are. So I was filling the space. I was beginning to answer the question of, you know, why waste your vote on Biden? I see Chris, but I don't hear him. Hey, Howie, I can't hear you. Uh, can, can you hear me? me now? Can you hear me now? Can you hear me, Howie? I can't hear you. I can hear you. <laughs> All right, I can't, I don't know what's going on. Uh, I'm gonna switch to another computer. Okay. I, I, don't, I can't, for some reason this audio has died. So while he's getting to his other computer, I, I was starting to make the argument of why you shouldn't waste your vote. And uh, I kind of want to save some of my argument for Chris. But, uh, you know, what I've been saying is if you're a progressive, a Sanders progressive or socialist and you vote for Joe, Joe Biden, you get lost in the sauce. They don't know that you're what your politics are. You've affirmed what Biden stands for. And if you want to fight for Medicare for all and a Green New Deal and an economic bill of rights and student and medical debt relief, you should vote for the green ticket, which is going to stand for those things. Everybody knows what a green vote stands for. A Democratic vote stands for what Joe Biden stands for. And if you don't stand for that, why waste your vote? The thing you should do is vote for what you want. We may not win the office, but those votes make a difference because they can't take us for granted. Great, am I back? Can you hear me now? I can hear you, yes. Okay, uh, so let's talk a little bit about uh, um, the tactic of the least worst. 
uh, which, you know, has been an election after election an utter failure. Why has that? Why has it been a failure? Well, because for progressives, socialists who want fundamental reforms, uh, you're voting against them because the Democrats don't support those things. Medicare for all, Joe Biden said if it crossed his desk, he'd veto it. Right. A Green New Deal. I think he labeled his pathetic climate action program a Green New Deal, but it's a it's about you know one thirtieth of what it's less than one thirtieth of what I'm proposing. You know, twenty seven trillion over ten years to rebuild all our productive systems for zero to negative greenhouse gas emissions and one hundred percent clean energy. Bernie Sanders was serious. He had sixteen point three trillion over ten years. His deadlines extended on certain sectors of the economy. But he was serious. All the rest of the Democrats were in the one to three trillion area. And Biden was the worst. He was the least. So, uh, you know, Bernie talked about an economic bill of rights like I've been talking about. That's something that's been around since Roosevelt was modified and improved by the civil rights movement. And here we are 75 years later and we don't have the right to a job, an income above poverty, affordable housing, comprehensive health care, lifelong public education or a secure retirement. So if you're for those things and you vote for Biden, you're voting against those things. But we've watched, you know, this least worst mantra has been with us since at least the Reagan administration. Uh, and because there's no pressure put on the Democratic Party, and this was uh, Ralph Nader, and I'm, uh, I work with Ralph. Uh, Ralph's idea was if we can pull five, 10, 15 million people who stand up for progressive values, this will begin to put pressure on the centers of power to perhaps respond. Uh, it didn't work. It's interesting that often Nader's polling numbers were quite high right before the election. But I think when people got in the booth, they got scared uh, and uh, and they didn't vote for Nader, even though they supported Nader. Uh, especially we'll talk about climate change. I mean, the, uh, this is an existential crisis. Uh, it, it's, uh, you know, there's been none of the environmental groups which attempt to work with the centers of power have been able to mitigate the rise of carbon uh, emissions and greenhouse gases or the melting of the polar ice caps or anything else. Uh, so that, that whole trajectory, and now of course we are faced with the uh, monstrosity of Trump uh, and, he, and he is, uh, you know, everything they say is and worse, uh, and that just, it becomes one more mechanism of fear that essentially has created paralysis within the left at a time when we're barreling towards uh, levels of unemployment not seen since the Great Depression. Uh, we're uh, dealing uh, inadequately with a pandemic that appears, uh, even Fauci and others suggest that will come in wave after wave after wave. Uh, and the corporate elites, Democrat and Republican, have done what they always do, which is bail out their own, uh, give what is largely a symbolic uh, uh, check out of the stimulus package for $1,200. All the people I know anecdotally can't get unemployment. They can't get on it. Um, uh, and so we're headed towards both an environmental and an economic crisis. Uh, and the ruling elites in the two parties uh, have have once again shown where their loyalty lies, and it's not with us. Yeah, I've been saying we're living in a failed state. I mean, Trump is obviously incompetent, doesn't care about us, only cares about himself. And Biden is invisible. Yeah. Instead of pointing to the things we need, like more than $1,200, like yeah. canceling rent, mortgage, and utility shutoffs and payments, and having the federal government pay those bills, uh, instead of this crazy payroll protection program, which failed to protect small businesses. We could have done what they did in Europe and just keep paying people through their regular payroll, you know, during the crisis. I mean, there are all kinds of things. And Biden has not been, I mean, at least Andrew Cuomo got out there and did news conferences every day and he looked sharp compared to Trump. Why didn't Biden do that? He's, they, I think, Pluff and, and uh, Axelrod called him the New York Times basement Biden the other day. And, you know, you wonder why they didn't talk directly to him. They had to go to the New York Times and do an op-ed, get your campaign together. So but, but, real, he can't string three sentences together, Biden. 
Yeah, yeah. Well, maybe that's the strategy. Let let Trump hang himself and Biden just avoid putting his foot in his mouth. But, you know, this less real thing, I go back to the Goldwater Johnson race and everybody said you got to vote for Johnson because Goldwater's crazy. He'll start a war. And as soon as Johnson was elected, he escalated in Vietnam. And what we did different in the anti-Vietnam War movement is we didn't we didn't go for the lesser evil. Our yeah. slogan was out now. And we put that on Kennedy and McCarthy, who are for negotiations now. We're saying, no, out now. We have nothing to negotiate. We put it on Humphrey and Nixon. And then in fall 69, we had massive demonstrations that scared Nixon and Kissinger. Right. The secret plan to end the war was to nuke North Vietnam. Right. And they, they figured he can't get reelected if he did that. They even thought it might cause a revolution, which being an anti-war movement, I don't think we're there yet. But that's what we can do if we maintain our independence. And, you know, Nader, uh, if he'd got some more votes, he might have been able to leverage like we did in New York, the Green Party. I got 5% of the vote running against Cuomo in 2014. And that was the year when he wanted to get ready to run for president. He wanted to get more than his father, Mario Cuomo, ever got, more than... He got when he first won in 2010, and he got less. And he couldn't take our voters for granted. So he adopted policies he had never supported, a ban on fracking, a $15 minimum wage, paid family leave. So if, you, if we vote for what we want and let the whole political system know and let the public know, then we can't be taken for granted. You but, know, the problem is this has been the dominant strategy on the left, you know, settle for the lesser evil. And the left disappears. It loses well, its own it, identity and voice. And they might as well be, you know, Biden operatives when they go, you know, say, vote for the lesser evil. And they literally disappear. You're right. I mean, yeah. look at the anti-war movement, which we were both part of against the Iraq war. It suspended all of its protests to get Kerry elected, who said he would out Fallujah Bush, you know. Right. Uh, and it never resuscitated itself. Uh, you, uh, the, the problem is that, you know, when you don't, when you stand, when rhetorically you stand for something, but you don't actually physically stand for something, you earn nothing but contempt, uh, both by the ruling elites and I think by many people in the working class itself, because they see that you won't stand up and fight for anything. And I have long said that the Democratic or the liberal establishment within the Democratic Party should have walked out in with NAFTA. Uh, we should have stood with the working class. We would not have ended up where we are now. Um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, climate change because, uh, again, the Democratic Party, Obama's rhetoric, for instance, was was good, uh, but he ended up drilling like Sarah Palin. Uh, and and I think that the uh, you know I think too often we're fooled uh, by the rhetoric and we don't actually look at the policies. Part of that is the fault of the media, which. Uh, you know, uh, it's all about personality and electability, manufactured personality, we should be clear. Uh, and it's, there's, it, there's no substance in terms of uh, actual reporting on policy, uh, because there is very little difference between the Republican and the Democratic Party on all of the major structural issues, whether that's the environment, whether that's war, whether that's wholesale surveillance, whether that's trade. Uh, whether that's mass incarceration or anything else. And I think that's a good example. You know, the Sanders campaign with Bill McKibben leading the delegation to the platform committee fought for a number of reforms and the Clinton people defeated them on every one, but they did get a change. They moved away from the language of all of the above energy policy, which was a euphemism for saying we're going to frack the hell out of the country and we're going to subsidize with uh, federal guarantees of the investments, new nuclear power plants. And it was out of the platform for a couple of years. And then in August, 2018, after Christine Pelosi, Nancy's daughter got this resolution, we won't take fossil fuel money. They came back in August and said, oh yes, we will. And we're recommitting to all of the above. So the, the symbolic victory that the Sanders campaign got in the platform was erased. And you know, Obama has made speeches to oil executives in Texas saying, Hey, I made the United States the number one oil and gas producer. That was me. They're bragging about it. And then they turn around and say, oh, we're worried about climate change. And they wring their hands. You know, Trump says climate change is a hoax, but the Democrats act as if it's a hoax. 
Let's talk about the Sanders campaign. Uh, I was with Shama Sawant. I did an event with Bernie and Bill McKibben, Naomi Klein, uh, the night before the climate march. And, and uh, Shama pushed Bernie at that time, 2016, to run as an independent, uh, arguing correctly, I think, that we were never going to build what he called a political revolution within an election cycle and that the Democratic Party would never give him the nomination. Uh, Bernie, uh, Bernie's answer to us was that he didn't want to end up like Ralph Nader which means he didn't want to end up a pariah. He didn't want to see the Democratic Party establishment take away his Senate seat in Vermont. Uh, he, he, Although he is registered as an independent, he functions as a de facto Democrat. He has seniority, he caucuses with them. He was in line for committee chairmanships, which Schumer had promised him. Uh, he was a loyal party apparatchnik, uh, you know, from 2016 to now. And of course they turned around and knifed him in the back. Uh, and and he you know is shredding what little credibility he has left uh, by endorsing Biden, just as uh, his credibility I think was deeply damaged by endorsing Clinton. He would do events in support of Clinton. A few hundred people would show up where ten thousand people had shown up before. Um, and I think that was uh, I think that was a moral failing. I think he wasn't wrong that the Democratic Party would have destroyed him, uh, but he wanted to be part of the club at our expense. Um, how do you look at the Sanders campaign? What what lessons do you think we can learn from it? Well, I think, first of all, Bernie drew the wrong lesson. Ralph Nader is only a pariah with the professional managerial class, the chattering class, the professional Democrats. I know in the backlash from those people after the 2000 election, when I went out to petition for him in 2004, if I went up to Syracuse University, yeah, I get a lot of pushback. If I went into the working class communities, the people of color communities, they said, yeah, Ralph Nader, he's for the people. Give me that petition. And, and even now, I, I get stuff from Ralph Nader. You know, we talk and he sends me, he's always sending information. And when I get a package and it says Ralph Nader on it, you know, the postal workers say, this is the Ralph Nader? You know, and they want to know what's in it. So Ralph is not a pariah. <laughs> And that's where Bernie lost touch, I think, you know, that the people at the grassroots, you know, they want a champion. They don't want somebody that goes against everything he said to back a candidate that he was competing with. So, I, you know, I think B Bernie made a wrong uh, evaluation there in terms of his own status. In terms of other lessons from the Sanders campaign, um, he should have learned the first time, the Democratic establishment, the last thing they want is a reformer like Bernie Sanders heading their ticket. And he had the standing, he could have gone independent and he would have brought a lot of people with him and helped us establish a real party on the left. And he decided he wasn't going to do that. Um, I think that's one lesson. I think the other thing, uh, and I don't know the details of this, apparently he did a good job in terms of grassroots organizing, building relationships with uh, Mexican-American groups in the Southwest. And that's why I did so good in Nevada and California with them and in Texas. But when it came to African-Americans in the South, those kind of relationships weren't built. So that is more than running an electoral campaign. That's the kind of organizing we on the left got to do. We got to stop doing like in the labor movement. We do corporate campaigns and political stuff. And we don't do the kind of organizing of actual people so that they can act for themselves in strikes or whatever actions they take against the bosses. You know, instead it's, you know, we rely on staffs and that's hurt the labor movement. It's hurt all the social movements. And I think it hurt the Sanders campaign when he tried to run again in 2020. If people vote for Biden, and I think you probably agree, Biden is actually a very weak candidate against Trump. I think the Democratic Party establishment is quite worried. Uh, uh, you know, that many people will probably stay home, uh, especially the younger demographic. Uh, uh, if people vote for Biden, how are they making the situation worse, even if Biden wins and you get rid of Trump? Well, we still don't have solutions to the climate crisis, to the inequality. And you mentioned mass incarceration and stagnant wages. The fact is working class life expectancies have been declining and Biden has no program for that. He has no basic set of rights that FDR once stood for, that 
A. Philip Randolph and Bayard Rustin and Martin Luther King March 4 and 63 and the Freedom Budget in 66 and the Poor People's Campaign in 68. That's completely off the agenda of Joe Biden. And then nuclear arms. The guy's a neoliberal hawk. He has, you know, and that's an issue. Just go back to nuclear arms. You know, I mentioned, I think, the bullets in the atomic scientists moved to a doomsday clock closer to midnight. Why the hell isn't any major presidential candidate talking about that? It should be a top campaign issue. The last bilateral treaty with Russia concerning strategic arms expires next February 5th. And there are no negotiations going on. You know, where the hell is Biden? He doesn't have solutions. So I think it get you know, I don't know if it gets worse if Biden's elected than if Trump's reelected, but the point is there are no solutions. And we're running out of time on the climate change. If you're in the bottom half of the income spectrum and you got to choose between going to the doctor and paying your rent or your utility bill. I mean, I know people, the guy who lived downstairs from me last year died. He's on Medicaid and he was taking kidney medicine. He decided he was going to skip it in April because he his utility bills were big because winter was over. And he paid his utility bill, didn't get his medicine, and he died of kidney failure in April. That's the kind of thing that's going on all across the country. So for those people, there isn't time to waste. And then, of course, you know, the nuclear arms race, we're on a hair trigger. And, you know, at any point, by mistake or by intention, it could be the end of us. So I want to fight for solutions, not just settle for somebody that has no solutions. What do you think the with the pandemic, uh, which is clearly going to be with us for a long time, with all of the health, uh, you know, the, the, the assault on people's health and the physical suffering coupled with the economic suffering, how is that going to affect, do you think, the political landscape? Well, I think it's going to hurt Trump big time. I mean, he's he's presiding over a health crisis and he, you know, I think everybody can see he doesn't know what the hell he's doing and he won't listen to the public health experts. And, you know, like I said, Biden is invisible. He's not pointing in the right direction. So, I think it's going to hurt Biden, I mean, Trump more than Biden. And, you know, the polls right now show Biden winning, winning in the battleground states. And, you know, it's his to lose. I mean, one thing I'll say, you know, if people want to blame the Green Party for Biden losing, no, Biden has everything going his way. And he just needs to run an effective campaign and get the Democratic Party base out. And he should crush Trump. So, you know, that shouldn't be the issue. Um, so... I forget what the original question was. I went on a tangent of why Biden should win. <laughs> but why should people vote green? I mean, what what's the core of your argument? Uh, they should vote for what they want. They should not be taken for granted. They should show what they stand for so that whatever vote we get, we use that as leverage going forward and we keep fighting for those things. And I believe, you know, people sometimes ask me, well, what do you do your first 100 days in the administration? And I say the odds of that are low. But what I do know we can do the first 100 days is try to organize the kind of massive nonviolent direct action we had in the anti-Vietnam War, we had in the civil rights movement, not just the symbolic little protests or the ritualized arrests that we do now, so that we're disruptive and we make them do it. You know, I mentioned Nixon. We stopped him from nuking North Vietnam. Another struggle was Reagan vetoed sanctions against South Africa after we had an anti-apartheid movement and got Congress to enact a bill that had been around for 20 years. And Reagan got overridden by Congress. You know, imagine that today. That's because we had a movement. So we can win these things. We don't have to have the office to make advances. So I think we got to see the campaign as a part of a longer process of organizing. And I go back to, we need to be organizers, not just mobilizers. Instead of mobilizing the usual people, we got to build relationships with the people we see who aren't voting. The working class people that's not voting, they're not so much apathetic as alienated. Well, they get it. It doesn't affect their lives one way or another. And that's a hundred million people. Yes. And you knock on their doors and talk to them and they're like, they'll pour their hearts out about what's going wrong. And they want to talk to you when issues come up, you know, if you've been working with them in our neighborhoods. And so they want something to vote for. And, you know, they basically see that 
the two major parties don't care about them, don't know about them, and they only see them when it's time to vote and they're asked to you know, come out with simplistic slogans like make America great again on one side and uh, vote for the lesser evil on the other side because Trump is a monster. And they say, that doesn't change my life. I, I'm disgusted right. with both of them. I think it comes down to fear that they're, they work to make us afraid and we've forgotten that our role is to make them afraid. Uh, that's the only way power responds. And you mentioned anti-war demonstrations. I think it was 71, tens of thousands of anti-war demonstrators surrounded the White House. And Nixon had put empty city buses end to end as a kind of barricade all around the White House. And Kissinger in his memoirs, who was there inside the White House, is standing with Nixon at the window and, and Nixon's wringing his hands going, Henry, Henry, they're gonna break through the barricades and get us. And that's why I don't vote Democrat. The, the point is to make them afraid of us. Uh, uh, if we can uh, stand up and conquer our own fear, uh, which of course is just pounded into us by the ruling elites and by their mandarins and corporate media uh, and turn the tables on them, then we can begin to truly affect change. Yeah, we have more power than we know. And I think people forget that. It's been discouraging. You know, the, the whole political system has moved to the right over the last 45, 50 years. But we have had victories. And, you know, when we stand up and speak out and rise up, they have to deal with us because in the end, we're the voters. And, you know, politicians, as much as they listen to their donors and not their voters, when they're afraid the voters might not vote for them, they start listening to the voters. And that's where we have some political leverage. Well, I'm hoping that with the rent strikes, the frontline workers who are being sacrificed on the altar of profit, uh, begin to see how callous uh, the ruling elites are. Uh, they will begin to organize, uh, and 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 we forget that that our weapon is the strike. Uh, that that is our weapon. It's collective. It's not individual, and it is the ability to shut businesses down, uh, to shut down commerce. Uh, that is our strength. Whether it's in Amazon or Whole Foods or uh, against slumlords like Jared Kushner or anywhere else. Uh, and I think that as we uh, descend into kind of an economic misery that has not been visited on this country for many decades, you will see uh, a kind of rising consciousness uh, as to uh, how callous these elites are, these corporate elites. Uh, and, uh, and hopefully people will begin to push back in a way that we should have been pushing back a long time before, but have not. And I remember the question you asked that I, I got off on a tangent and forgot, and that was the climate and, and this right. economic climate we're going into. I mean, we are diving into a deep depression. I mean, the payroll pro protection program, which was small, loans of small businesses didn't work. Big businesses grabbed the money, wasn't enough money. And small businesses who employ half the people in this country most of them didn't have a month's worth of cash reserves. They're going out of business now. Those right. jobs are being destroyed. And with the whole shutdown, investors who might invest to create new jobs, they're scared to death. They're just you know, rearranging who owns the assets we got by trading stocks and bonds. They're not investing in new productive assets. And consumers who are hammered aren't going to go out on spending sprees. They're going to hoard what they got to pay you know, essential bills if they can. So that's a recipe for a depression. And behind that, we already had a huge debt overhang in the corporate sector, the government sector, household sector. And as those payments can't be made, you might have credit collapse. Uh, we have excess capacity. So there wasn't much reason even before the coronavirus hit to invest in new productive capacity, which points toward what we got to do. European countries are doing some of this, not on a big enough scale. And in the package that just came out from Pelosi and the Democrats, there's none of it. And that is we need to invest in a Green New Deal to rebuild our productive apparatus for climate safety and environmental safety and 100% clean energy. So, for example, go from coke ovens to electric arc furnaces for steel and cement that doesn't use calcium carbonate, which when heated up, the, the carbonate goes into the atmosphere. That's 5% of the world's carbon footprint. We got to rebuild our productive apparatus. Now we have a good opportunity to do it. And our leaders in both parties, they're not even thinking that way. They're just going stopgap emergency measures 
Democrats want to look like they're trying to do something. Republicans are now deficit hawks again after, you know, running up the deficit with tax cuts. I mean, it's ridiculous. It's appalling what we're getting from the two major parties. But I think, you know, we need to be talking about the Green New Deal is the big public investment we need to get out of this depression we're diving into. And we have to, I think, as you have said, divert our funds from the military industrial complex, uh, which now consumes more than half of all discretionary spending and has orchestrated, I would argue, coming out of the Middle East, I spent seven years there, the greatest strategic blunder in American history, nearly two decades of endless war. Uh, we have to break the military, you know, as as uh, I think it was Alexander Berkman or somebody, you know, no, it was um, uh, Leibniz who called the, you know, the military, the militarists, the enemy within, uh, and they are. Uh, they, uh, their power has to be broken and those funds have to be diverted uh, to life sustaining, life enhancing, life protecting programs uh, rather than uh, endless war and death. Yeah, I'm calling for 75% cut in military spending, getting out of these endless shooting wars, start withdrawing from 800 foreign military bases in the special ops in over 100 countries, and be the world's humanitarian superpower with the global Green New Deal instead of, and make friends instead of enemies by being the world's global military empire. And uh, you're not going to hear that from Biden any more than Trump. And that, you're right, that's fundamental because that's a lot of resources that we can redirect with new priorities into uh, the people's needs and protecting the, ourselves from climate disaster. Great, Howie. Thank you very much. Good luck. Thank you. Got my vote. Uh, I, I wish you all the best. Thank you very much.